All right, so let's kick off the 2023 Halloween season and my 31 days of horror movies and just discussion of horror-related things, whether it's be TV shows or franchise. We're going to talk about a franchise that I really loved at the very beginning, but gradually over the years, I've kind of just watched them as a sort of means to an end. It's sort of like I feel obligated to watch them because I've invested a lot of time in them. And truthfully speaking, I love the original. So Paranormal Activity was released in 2009, I believe, worldwide. It originally was filmed and released in 2007. But it was only an independent film that went around and did the indie circuit and then was later picked up by Paramount Pictures. One of the interesting things about this film is that it's written, directed, and produced by the um, the same guy, uh, Oren Pelly. And Oren Pelly did all of this for like 15 grand, which is pretty cool when you think about... 2009 and being a different time and these days i think that equivalates to about 60 grand something like that maybe like 50 grand in today's money so to speak but it's still pretty cheap to make a film and to make a film that's as good and as compelling as paranormal activity compelling enough that it led to there being six sequels two video games, and a Japanese movie made in its honor. So when you start with that first one and you move forward, you you see that it's had an impact on, on the world. What's interesting, though, is when it got its original start and it cost 15 grand to make the first film... You um you were doing it was doing the indie circuit and then you see that Paramount Pictures picks it up and wants to do it worldwide. So Paramount Pictures wants the distribution rights and then Blumhouse has the production rights. So once they pick it up, it then gets bumped up to a budget of about an extra two hundred thousand because they had to do some reshoots and they redid the ending. That's why I think this film has three alternate endings now. So that's what a lot of that money came to doing all this stuff over again. And then this went on to gross about $194 million. That's how big the first film was. So you knew that this was going to be something special moving forward. A little story time about uh, my experience with the first film was that I knew nothing about it. It just kind of went into theaters. A couple of my friends knew about it. So I went to the movie theater with them that the, the weekend it was premiering. And I knew zero about the film because I had never heard of it before. And they were just like, this is the biggest horror movie of the year. And blah, blah, blah. They were really into it. And I was like, okay, I'll go. So we get to the theater and the theater's packed. Like This is when theaters would pack out for movies like this. And they find a couple of seats together, but they're short one person. So I happen to look down and I see one of the single seats, because sometimes you'll have movie theaters, they'll have like sort of um, handicap seating where they'll put like uh, specialty seats for people with disabilities or single seats together so that somebody who is disabled, maybe in a wheelchair, they can sit next to a person if they're going with one person. Those two people can take up that space. So it's one chair by itself, nothing else next to it for like 10 feet. So I see one of those chairs opened, and so I go and I take it. So I'm sitting by myself watching this movie essentially alone the very first time, not knowing a thing about it, and I loved it. I loved this first movie so much. It's so simplistic, and it gives you those old-school Blair Witch vibes, and I had done a um, an entry about uh, Skin of Marink uh, a little while ago, about how that was kind of trying to be experimental and that was meant to be the cheapest you know, horror movie made these days, which is crazy to think about because it's been years since that's been done. And I want to say Paranormal Activity is probably the last time it was done like that. And it's just such really good quality. For what they pulled off, it's really good quality. It set up a really creepy atmosphere that's kind of made fun of these days. But, you know, then it was unique and it was sort of different nobody had expected them to kind of do found footage in this fashion because it is very simple and it is just a lot of you know uh wire trick and camera tricks and just you know it's the, the simple scare of just you don't know what's happening when you're asleep at night so you have that one it makes a tremendous mark it leaves its tremendous mark on the world and then uh i want to say a year later they release Paranormal Activity 2. So now, 
Here's where we start getting into the era, because I want to say between that time, let's say 2009 and like 2015, we started getting movies where you would get the first one, it would be huge, and then you're like, okay, a sequel makes sense, but then they would be spitballing these things into such ridiculous lengths where you start to lose its essential plot the more films you put in there because it's no longer making any sense. Here, for Paranormal, Paranormal Activity 2, the story is so, like, connected that it makes the most sense, which is why the first two Paranormal Activities are the ones I love the most. Paranormal Activity 1 set a good foundation. Paranormal Activity 2 really built on that and kind of expanded the world a little bit in the right manner. Like, it didn't overdo it. It didn't underdo it. It was just the right amount of how do we do the same thing over again and still kind of capture what the first one did while still making the story make sense. Now, one of the interesting things about this uh, second film is that, so you take uh, the the original writer and director, Oren Pelly. Between the second film and the most recent one that came out two years ago, um, he's not involved as a director. He's not involved in the story. He doesn't write the story. He's not a writer. He's not a screenplay author. Nothing. He wrote, directed, and produced the first one, and every other one after that, he's just a producer. And, you know, when you look at Oren Pelly's um, track record, he's involved in a lot of the biggest horror movies that have been coming out over the years. Not only was he involved in the entire uh, Paranormal Activity franchise, he also is the producer of the entire Insidious franchise as well. He's one of the producers on that franchise. He was also the producer of The Bay, which is another really good found footage movie. He um, is the producer of Chernobyl Diaries, which is a kind of lackluster found footage film, but it's just like showing you the path he's kind of taking is kind of within the same realm. Um, even though Insidious isn't really found footage, it's still a really good series. So he's involved in that series as well, but he doesn't go on to direct anything else except for a movie I've never heard of, Area 51 from like 2015. That's the last time he directs a film, and that's only two films he's ever directed and he wrote that one too so i might have to try to find this film and check it out this month to see like what it brings to the table as far as um what he was able to do like his very first the like, directorial debut is paranormal activity not only was he the director of that and the producer and the writer he also edited the entire thing himself i think it was in his house i believe he spent like i don't know 10 grand just remodeling his stairs so the stairs made sense with how he wanted to lay out his house for what he was writing for the movie like that's how deep he went into that first film and that blew him up so he's involved in all these other movies over the last you know 15 years that are all huge you know insidious is a huge franchise and that last insidious film was really good so he's involved in all of these uh, at least as a producer so he doesn't get involved in any of the paranormal activities as far as writing and directing. He's just a producer for them. So I also like appreciate that um, that director, Tom Williams, for Paranormal Activity 2 and those writers because they did justice to the story. Now, one of the writers, uh, Christopher Landon, he stays on and basically does the next group of films I want to say he does up until the marked ones. Now, after that, it kind of gets a little crazy with Ghost Dimension, where almost nobody's involved from any of the other films from what I've seen. Uh, and then Christopher Landon comes back and he writes Next of Kin. But Next of Kin is also a very strange film, and I'll get to those in a little bit. I'm digressing a little bit past Paranormal Activity 2. Um, but going back to the second one, it just continues the story in a very good way. Now, the first story tells of um, Kate and Mika. They find that, you know, there's a haunting in their house or there's things going on. He buys a bunch of cameras, set them up, and he wants to kind of film what's happening and, like, review it and see what's going on in his house. We discover that there's some demon that has followed Katie her whole life and wants to, you know, possess her. By the end of the film, the demon possesses her. So then you go into the second film, and it's a completely different family. We don't know what the connection is, but they have sort of the same setup, although it's the house's security cameras that are already there, which kind of, like, extended on the 
how do we make it found footage without being too like like why is everybody always filming everything but then again we didn't know that we would eventually lead into the era where everybody literally films everything so found footage makes more sense as the years progress but they make it make sense with you know the security of the house they have security cameras outside facing the street facing the pool they make it make sense and you don't learn until very later on in the movie after they go through their possession where they try to take possession of the mother and they eventually get her like exercise and the demon leaves you don't realize that that mother is katie's sister so it's sort of a prequel to the first one where it leads into how katie started being the one targeted and then Katie gets possessed. Katie shows up, kills the family, including the sister, and then kidnaps the baby. Essentially, what they wanted was the baby in the end, because that's what Katie does. Katie takes the baby and kind of leaves after she kills everybody. So that's how they kind of make those first two films connect and make sense. Now, Paranormal Activity 3 is it sort of takes that, that prequel level stuff... And it goes back even further. It goes back 18 years before the the premise of the first two films. And I'm pretty certain it tells the story of, you know, um, Katie and Christy as their sisters, which Christy is the mother from uh, Paranormal Activity 2. So, again, you're talking 20 years into the future. They have to make that make sense as well. So, from what I gather is meant to be the point of the third one. It, it's been a couple of years since I've seen these because after the third one, I kind of just don't care anymore because they really went all out. Because now it's no longer this connection of a demon who just wants one of the children. It's now their whole bloodline that's apparently cursed and that's what they need. They need the the next born like um, f- female child or the next born son in some capacity. So there's this coven and there's this cult involved, and they sort of lead into how they take Katie and Christy in some way. Like, it just, it it didn't connect the same way, even though it d- still did really successfully. It's not as good as what the first two build up as a story. It doesn't connect for somebody like me who was really, like, you know, loving these movies so far. Uh, it doesn't do as good as the first two films either. I think the second film cost about $3 million to make, and it grossed like, I don't know, $200 million. This is the same thing. It's five, I think it's $5 million to make, and it only did $200 million as well, but that's not a progression. You're not getting sort of bigger as it goes along. And then you go into Paranormal Activity 4. Completely different family, no connection to... Um, what happens in the first three films at all, except at the very end where they acknowledge that, yes, there is this demon, but it's the cult, and the cult lives across the street from this family, and then you see Katie again close to the end of it, and essentially the entire movie is unnecessary because it, you, it, it just shows all the same stuff the first three were doing, but now you're not even involved in the family anymore. You're not. There's no connection to the family whatsoever. They're just friggin' neighbors. That's, that's what I remember it being. I remember it just being that Katie lived across the street. I think the daughter, who's the focus of the fourth film, sort of starts feeling bad for the son, um, Toby, who's kind of grown up. So I think this takes place, uh, I think, like 10 years after. It's the only actual sequel. They don't say how many years, but it's the only actual sequel. The first three, it's like two and three are prequels to one. So technically speaking, if you're talking two prequels, this is the only actual sequel to the story that progresses past the time frame where the first one takes place. And it doesn't fail. It's just still not good. It's still not what people were sort of, I guess, expecting, at least for me as like this person who was really diehard into paranormal activity at the very beginning. And I thought, okay, maybe the fourth one, they're actually going to continue some kind of story. And they don't. It doesn't follow Katie. It doesn't follow anything. It's just this random family that just so happens to be unlucky that lives across the street from them. And of course, it's also that they have all these cameras and everybody's recording. So it just so happens they move across the street from somebody who um, is the leader of a cult. And what are the chances, you know? But that's what movies are kind of made of. So maybe I'm kind of nitpicking now, but it's still not as good. So after how 
abysmal three and four are for me at least we go into the fifth film which is also a sequel but it's like not even connected to the to to, to anything it's just another kind of story which if this is what what they were going for if they were going for this idea of um doing what the storyline is that paranormal activity was building this you know possession and this overtaking and you were talking about different stories in that universe then i think that would be a little bit like better almost like how every season of american horror story is different like if every paranormal activity was different and just sort of these stories of possession that are all found footage that take place in different sort of areas that don't have any connection whatsoever i'd be cool with that I don't know if this film was meant to follow that path, but it's at the very end, it really makes this stretch of a connection. Like we're going into the realms of like what Amityville horror was doing and Amityville, the connections that all these Amityville movies made are just so ridiculous. The connection they tried to make with this is just so, so bad at the very end of the film. The character Jesse kind of just like, he he's in this realm of where like the possession kind of exists. And then he transfers into the house that the first film takes place. Like that's the only connection that apparently the spirits or whatever that they were experiencing in the house. in the first one was actually the character Jesse from this fifth film. Maybe like, it's just so dumb. Like the connection just doesn't fit. It doesn't make any sense. Why is it that there's a sequel that makes sense in what the fourth one tried to do? At least it was a sequel that took place after the events. And now you have this other one that maybe it takes place after the events. Maybe it doesn't take place after the events. Because now you're talking about time travel or interdimensional, you know, path crossing in a way. It just, it, it was so bad and it was a really poor flop for the entire franchise. When you're talking, all the other films did, you know, nine figures. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars, the first four films. Here comes the fifth film and it bombs completely. Not too bad. You know, when you're talking like a $9 million budget and then you do 90 million, not bad, but nowhere near what those first four movies were doing. So what do you think you would do? Do you think you would maybe double down and go back to trying to fix something or redo something or retconning something? I don't know if the sixth film retcons anything, but then they come out with Ghost Dimension, which I guess is meant to sort of explain the interdimensionalness of this of this environment that they're building, of this world they're building. But now Ghost Dimension comes along and it's just very lackluster. It just totally gets devoid of anything they were trying to do. They sort of try to make a connection to the fourth film again because maybe they are trying to essentially retcon the fifth film in a way and make it where it it doesn't matter. I I don't remember a lot about Ghost Dimension. It really was, to me... To me, the the two worst ones are this one and Marked Ones, which aren't the two worst ones in the series, I would say, probably critically wise. Just for me, Marked Ones is definitely the worst, and right after that, it's definitely Ghost Dimension. I did not like Ghost Dimension at all, uh, up until we get to the seventh installment. So now here's the thing. We did, Ghost Dimension comes out like 2015, eight years ago. So they were doing like a one movie a year, every year, sort of consistently. They don't do another movie. I'm guessing because Ghost Dimension flopped like really hard. Like it's poorly reviewed across the board. Nobody gives it uh, a good score basically anywhere. I think it's got like 15% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's got like a three on IMDb. It's got like a C on Metacritic. It's it's really poorly reviewed across the board. Nobody likes Ghost Dimension. Then you would think, okay, this might be the end of the franchise. We're going to leave it alone. No, six years later, they come out with Paranormal Activity next to Kin. Now, uh, after Ghost Dimension, I was so far removed from the Paranormal Activity franchise 
because of how upset I was. It's just this this poor selection of just trying to make money off of a title that you get you 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 sacrifice good storytelling and trying to make things make sense. So what do they do? They come out two years ago with Paranormal Activity next to Kin, flies completely under my radar until recently when I'm like, I wonder, you know, maybe we should revisit like Paranormal Activity and I start looking into it and I'm like, seven films? There was another one? This next of Kin flew clean under my radar. I had no idea this came out and it's probably because it went direct to Paramount+. Plus. So it was a it was a straight video on demand film that was made, and I can't find any production stuff or anything for this as far as how much it costs to make, but it is bad. I'm not gonna say that it's rated as worse as anything else because I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure Ghost Dimension still holds the worst ratings on things like Rotten Tomatoes or anything, but to me, this was now king of the worst for Paranormal Activity. This film is just so so bad and it just it hurts me so much that it turned into this so i'm guessing it's another thing where they tried to do this it just takes place in the same universe as paranormal activity but it's a completely separate storyline that sort of is the same thing as what happened to the family so like you have nothing involved with the families whatsoever there has nothing to do with um the, the 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 cult that you were sort of grown to know or whatnot it's a completely new thing it's it's a complete standalone sequel there's nothing about this film that connects to anything else except for the fact that it's called paranormal activity and it's sort of about the same demon and then it follows this girl who is trying to find her mother and her mother left her at like the hospital and she grew up not knowing her family Later on down the line, she does like a 23 and Me, and so does her long-lost brother. And the reason that she never found any of them was because her home family was apparently Amish, and so the brother was on like his rumspringer and did a 23 and Me because he never knew what that was and he wanted to sort of see. So then he discovered his sister, and he's like, yeah, come back, meet your family, you know, after sort of the your mother sort of abandoned us and that's the storyline they built is that the mother was really against the amish culture and was trying to like break out and for anybody that knows amish culture or has ever seen like the i think it's an a and e original series where it's um what's it called like breaking amish or something it's very difficult to be in that environment unless you're full in it like the Amish are really into their culture and they're really into how they how they run their communities. So if you go against anything that they do, which is why they sort of give their youngers, um, their, their, their young people, the rumspringer, because it allows them to go out and experience the outside world because then they get to choose if they want to go out there and continue their life or come back to the community and, you know, be there for for the rest of their lives. You know, I think it's very 50-50. I'm not sure. I don't know a lot about the Amish culture. All I know is that if you decide to stay out, then you're out. There is no coming back. You are disowned by your whole family. And that's sort of what this story builds up is that this girl's mother was doing that. She went in for the rumspringer, got pregnant. She was forced to give the baby up. She refused. They kicked her out, I'm guessing, like, as a rebellious move to challenge them in some way. She didn't realize how bad it was, you know, had the kid, realized she couldn't take care of it, and dropped it off. That's the story they build. But essentially, the, of course, that's not what is really happening. What's really happening is they, these people aren't Amish. This is another cult that prays to this demon, who I can't recall if the demon is the same across the board. Uh, but they, they pray to Osmodius. And Osmodius is basically, they, you sort of get the feeling like they're trying to control him or trying to go through with the possession. But in reality, they're more trying to keep the demon at bay. So they aren't Amish and they are a cult, but they're actually the good guys. And the bad guys are really these people who come into their homes are recording everything because they think this is a finding your family out, finding out your family is Amish documentary they're trying to make. And essentially they're just like, hell no, we have to figure out what's really going on here. So they're breaking all their rules. Nobody's kicking them out yet because the second you break the rules of the Amish after you've been invited into their house, you're banished. You're, you're getting kicked out within the, within the hour. 
they don't kick them out and none of that gets alarming to anybody. Like they're trying to break into their church. They're going into rooms that are meant to be locked and no one's like, okay, you have to leave now. That didn't alarm anybody. Like the Amish aren't being Amish. <laughs> like that's, that's one dumb thing that about the movie. The other dumb thing is that this lady is just, she, she's just a poor collection of all the movie tropes that you hate about found footage films. The, the, the one saving grace is the actor who played the sound guy. I don't know what his name is, but whoever the sound guy actor is, he's tremendous. I, I found him immediately enjoyable the second he started on the screen and he started showing off like his personality. I thought he was the best part of the whole movie. But her, the main girl of the movie, she is, she, she has good facial expressions and she has good acting capabilities. But what the character was written for was just really bad in general. Like, it's every bad movie trope for found footage-style films, or even possession-style films. She's going into rooms she doesn't know. She's not questioning, like, anything about what everybody's doing. They're like, don't go into the church, and they have... it's a, The church is all black, and there's writing all over the place. Don't go into the church. Oh, what does she do? She wants to sneak into the church. She's doing everything that's... You don't think a person should do in that predicament, and I get it. We're talking about a movie that's if she wasn't like that, it wouldn't move the plot. But you have a you need to have a person have certain of those tropes. When you have too many of those tropes, you're talking it's poorly written because all you're doing is the same cliche things that you would see in every other movie, which you're expecting out of a video on demand movie like any other randomness that was kind of written by somebody who just didn't have the production value kind of got it picked up and it went on to Netflix and it was put into the obscure section. That's what you expect out of those things. This is a fucking paranormal activity. This is a, this is paramount owned franchise meant to be part of this huge franchise that you wrote and put out there. That's just cliche after cliche after cliche and there's, there's parts where it doesn't even f fully follow through with found footage quality. Like, there's a whole scene where they're having dinner, and there's a camera span that goes across everybody's face. What, what fucking found footage is that doing in? Found footage is meant to be sort of stationary. It's meant to sort of uh, depict what's happening from a certain point of view. Maybe if you have three cameras, you can get three different angles. There's literally a scene that goes on for about a minute and a half that's them dancing and singing at the dinner table, and we're spanning across faces, we're jumping shots, like, it's a regular movie, it's not a found footage movie. That's poor quality found footage. That's really bad in, in terms of what you're trying to portray as a found footage film. Now... I'm a found footage fanatic. I love the concept of mockumentaries, found footage films. I've loved them since their inception with the Blair Witch Project. They are tremendous. There is a certain thing, there's a certain quality in the cinematography that you have to have, and this drops the ball on it too many times for my liking. Next of Kin is up there as the worst paranormal activity in the franchise. I don't care if it's a standalone sequel. If you're going to take that name and you're going to connect it to this world and you're going to continue to ruin it and beat it into the ground, it fucking infuriates me. Those first two films are tremendous and they did not deserve the treatment they got for the years following. Let's go, let, let's just retcon every film after film two. And let's start fresh and maybe see what else we can do. Don't give me a fucking Paranormal Activity reboot. Give me better quality stories that derive from the original quality of the first two. Make them connect. Make them make sense in their connection. And don't just make a film and attach the name just because you think it's going to make you money. I guarantee you, nobody else really cares about this film as much because most people probably don't even know it exists. Because unless you were really following it for the time frame, this would have flown straight under your radar just like it did for me, and I didn't discover it until two years after it came out. This is so upsetting to see where this franchise has gone into, and I'm going to say if it wasn't dead after Ghost Dimension in 2015, it's definitely dead after this one, and it just pisses me off.